Hello everyone. Today we continue Chapter 7, Gaseous Exchange. Uh, still in uh, Syllabus 7.1, Gaseous Exchange in Human. Okay, but we move on to Part B. Previously, we discussed Part A in which we learned to outline structure of the human respiratory system as well as the microscopic structure of the alveolar wall. Okay, now we move on into the structure of hemoglobin. Now before I start into the theory of hemoglobin, let me just uh, discuss a little bit about the blood. What you see in this picture here is all the blood vessels in our body that is helping to transport blood. And in fact, our body contains 5 liters of blood altogether. From that 5 liters of blood, if we take 1 drop of blood, that equals to 1 millimeter cube of blood, you find that there will be 5 million red blood cells. Now if we take 1 red blood cell, okay, we find that it will contain 280 million hemoglobin molecules. Now those hemoglobin molecules, as you can see in the picture here, can transport up to 4 oxygen molecules. So my question to you is, how many oxygen molecules are transported all together in our whole body. Okay, so as you think of the answer to this question, let me move to the theory. The picture here is showing us a diagram of a hemoglobin molecule. Now you know hemoglobin is a protein and here we can actually classify it as a quaternary protein, as a globular protein, or even as a conjugated protein. Hemoglobins are actually made up of 140 amino acids and they are grouped into four subunits, namely alpha subunits and beta subunit. Now these polypeptide chains are then rolled into a three-dimensional structure causing them to be called a globular protein and in three-dimensional structures, there is always a pocket. So like when we studied enzyme before, the pockets are the enzyme's active site. So in the case of hemoglobin, the pocket here actually can place a non-protein prosthetic group called the heme. So let's move on next to understand the structure of heme. This is the structure of heme. You do not have to memorize how to draw it. Okay, however, you must be able to recognize that this is heme. Heme has two parts. Okay, that is the outer ring known as the porphyrin ring and the center core which contains ferrous ion, Fe2+. So that is why it is attracted to oxygen, which is O2 negative. Now in semester one, there was also a ring structure like this, okay, but it had a longer hydrocarbon chain at the bottom, okay, but the center contained magnesium. So that was the diagram for the pigment chlorophyll. This is the diagram for the pigment of hemoglobin. Okay, so if in objective questions, a diagram like this appears, take note of the center, whether it is a ferrous ion for hemoglobin or a magnesium ion for chlorophyll. So with that, we have completed our description of the structure of hemoglobin. I now move on to part C, that is to explain the transport of oxygen. Okay, transport of oxygen is something that you are familiar with. 
When we inhale, oxygen will travel down the respiratory system to the lungs. Okay, specifically at the alveolus. Now we learned in the earlier video that the alveolus is surrounded by a rich network of blood capillaries. So in that blood capillary, there will be red blood cells containing hemoglobin. Okay, so you know one hemoglobin will actually bind to four oxygen molecules. So when a hemoglobin is bound to four oxygen molecules, we call that oxyhemoglobin. Now this oxyhemoglobin is transported throughout our body for our body cells to use. So for example, for muscle contraction like this, oxygen is required. So what will happen is oxyhemoglobin will release the oxygen molecules and return as hemoglobin. The oxygen molecules will go to the muscle tissues, for example in this case, to carry out aerobic respiration. Now when hemoglobin binds to four molecules of oxygen, we call it oxyhemoglobin. The biochemical reaction for that is Hb plus 4O2, that is before it binds, becomes HbO8 or HbO2 bracket 4, that is oxyhemoglobin. Now, this process happens at the lungs because lungs have a high oxygen partial pressure. Now, let's look at what happens at the tissues. Now, at the tissues, there is low oxygen partial pressure. So, what happens now is that the oxyhemoglobin will actually dissociate from the oxygen molecules to become hemoglobin once more and release for oxygen for the use of the cells. So keep in mind at the lungs hemoglobin will bind to oxygen but at the tissues hemo oxyhemoglobin will dissociate from oxygen. What I have explained to you so far are things that you already know. So now I'm going to start on something that you may not know about oxygen transport. Now oxygen can be transported in our body in two ways. The most popular way that is at about 99% of the oxygen is transported in the form of oxyhemoglobin in the red blood cells. Okay, but there is a balance of around 1%, okay, specifically 1.5%, that is transported as dissolved gas in our blood plasma. So the oxygen that diffuses from the alveolus into the blood capillary, 99% diffuse into the red blood cell. However, 1% will diffuse into the blood plasma. This information may be necessary for you when answering objective questions. Next, I will explain what actually happens in the red blood cell. Now, the mechanism of how hemoglobin becomes oxyhemoglobin uses a concept called positive cooperativity. What this concept uh, tries to explain is as follows. Okay, we take this diagram to represent the structure of hemoglobin. And these are the pockets that I mentioned where in green here you can see the heme is present. So what you can see from the diagram is that the opening for the uh, binding with heme is actually very narrow. So, four oxygen mole molecules cannot easily enter and bind. So, to start the binding of oxygen with hemoglobin, only one molecule actually binds. One molecule of oxygen binds. But when the one molecule of oxygen successfully binds, what happens is there is a change in the shape of the first subunit 
and this change causes the other three subunits to also change in structure. So you can notice here now the opening of the pocket is bigger. This will promote the binding of the second oxygen. So once the second oxygen binds, there is a change in the structure of that subunit which is then transmitted to the other two subunits that will also change their structure making them more easy for the third oxygen to bind. So likewise, once the third oxygen has bound, there is a change in the structure of the third subunit which is transmitted to the fourth subunit, making it finally easy for the fourth oxygen to bind. And finally, oxyhemoglobin forms. So this is what we mean by positive cooperativity. Okay, that is one oxygen helps the other three oxygens to bind. Okay, so hopefully from this, you can understand the concept of positive cooperativity. Next, I will explain in a sentence form so that you are able to answer in an essay. Now, at the lungs, due to high partial pressure of oxygen, one oxygen molecule will first bind to one heme molecule in the hemoglobin. When that one oxygen molecule binds, there is going to be a conformational change in that one hemoglobin subunit. The change in that one hemoglobin subunit is then transmitted to the other three hemoglobin subunits. Now, what this conformational change does is that it will increase the affinity of the heme to oxygen molecules. So, meaning that the hemoglobin becomes more attracted to the oxygen molecules. And as I explained just now, one by one, the oxygen molecules will bind until finally an oxyhemoglobin forms. So this is the concept of positive cooperativity. Okay, I remind you, it is when one oxygen binds, it changes the structure of one subunit and then that change is transmitted to the other subunits and this causes the hemoglobin to increase its affinity to oxygen and finally, four oxygen molecules are bound to the hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin is produced. So this is the story of what happens at the lungs. So an oxygen transport graph will actually take on this sigmoid structure due to the positive cooperativity concept. Okay, so beginning you see there is 0% of saturation with oxygen Okay, when the hemoglobin hasn't bound to any oxygen. Then when it binds to one oxygen molecule, you find that the affinity of the hemoglobin increases. So very quickly the graph starts to increase where two oxygens bind and then three oxygen bind. Now after the third oxygen is bound, you see the graph tends to slow down. Eh? It is not increasing that fast anymore because it is a bit more difficult for the fourth oxygen to bind since now there is the space is quite tight. Okay, But finally, when the graph is a bit of a constant, that is when hemoglobin has become oxyhemoglobin. Now the reverse will happen at the tissues. Since the tissues have low partial pressure of oxygen, we find that first one oxygen molecule will dissociate or unload of the heme molecule. Okay, it is not that all four is released at the same time. Eh? 
first one oxygen molecule will unload and then when one exits there is going to be a reversal conformational change that means instead of opening up it is going to start to close so when there is a reversal conformational change that change now will be transmitted to the other three hemoglobin subunits Now the reversal conformational change will then cause the hemoglobin to decrease its affinity towards oxygen. So because of that, the second oxygen molecule or the third oxygen molecule will start to exit very quickly. Okay, and uh, finally a hemoglobin will form once again. This is actually the opposite of what happens at the lungs but just because it is the opposite do not wrongly conclude that this is negative cooperativity okay we only talk about positive cooperativity at the lungs and at the tissue we will just explain there is no special term to be used during oxygen dissociation at the tissues. Now if we look at this graph once again, okay, earlier when we were talking about oxygen transport at the lungs, we looked at the graph from left to right where the partial pressure of oxygen increase. Now we can use the same graph to explain what happens at the tissues but we will read it from right to left where the partial pressure of oxygen is decreasing. So you can see initially the hemoglobin has bound to four oxygen molecules. So we call it an oxyhemoglobin. And then as the partial pressure begins to decrease, we find that one oxygen will exit. And once one oxygen exits, then there is a reverse in conformational change making the hemoglobin reduce its affinity to oxygen so the oxygen molecules will exit very quickly so that's why you see the graph starts to go down very fast okay so this is how we will interpret the graph the same graph when we are talking about either the lung or the tissue if lung we will see the graph as increasing but at tissue we will see the graph as decreasing. With that we have come to the end of the explanation on the transport of oxygen. Next video will be about transport of carbon dioxide. So before I say goodbye, let's talk about the riddle I left you with just now. So how many oxygen molecules are transported all together? Did you get 2.8 times 10 to the power 22? Okay, now don't worry if you didn't get the number. It is not an STPM question. I just put this in the video to make you aware of how much oxygen is in your body keeping you alive and functioning. Okay, so with that, I, I bid farewell, goodbye and see you in my next video.